Steve, can we do a mic check? Could you just do a quick verse of a song for us to see if the audio is coming through? Are you looking for late 80s rock, or what are you looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, yeah, any, any chorus from any one of those uh, favorite songs would be great. Yeah, I definitely could do that. I don't know if it's being recorded, because that would not be fair to the public. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh, you're ready? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'd like to welcome um, anybody viewing this to our HR committee meeting of the Wanatee Community School Board. We did start at uh, 9 o'clock. We are now back in open session. And the next item we have is a budget update. And I'm assuming Steve is going to do that for us. Thanks, Joan. Uh, what I want to just cover for a couple of minutes is just taking us back to the budget process for last spring and what we identified as a placeholder in the budget for salary and benefit increases. So in your uh, board book packet, we did attach a file I want to make clear that this is the same file that was attached and presented to the budget committee last April. That means it has not been updated with the what I will call is actual and real data from this fall. That was data from last spring based on making projections for the 2020 2021 school year. I'm bringing this forward based on the file from last April as really a reminder of what placeholder we put into the budget planning process with understanding that once this meeting is completed and we get a chance to talk through uh, not only where we are budget wise, but where we are with our FTE positions and also some options for consideration you know on the financial end then we will move into the process of putting together an actual complete proposal for all employee groups based on the the real numbers from this fall so just wanted to kind of set that context that what you're seeing in that packet is not real data from this fall it's planning data from last April. And as a reminder, our planning data from last April uh, included, is it still up on the screen? No, no. Which one would you like to share? Um, if you could, I'm sorry, if you could please bring up that spreadsheet. It's got all of the various employee groups um, that was included in the, in the packet. It was called April 2021. Yeah, we, we've, uh, we've got it up, Steve. They're trying to uh, figure out a way to, to rotate it. The, uh, the, the HR director uploaded it uh, in, in a way so it involves crooked, a crooked neck syndrome to read it. Oh, got it. Just let me know when you're ready. We're good. Okay. So this document in front of you was the placeholder piece and just to remind ourselves of what we identified in there it was the cpi as calculated to the amount possible on july 1st of 2020 the minimum points increase that's indicated in the teacher handbook which is six hundred dollars and then an equivalent salary and benefit increase for members of the non-teaching staff. So that was just placed in there as a hold until we get to the fall. Now, as board members who have been through this in the past know, our goal has always been to have an improved situation financially when we get to the fall. 
And what I mean by that is historically, our student count has ended up a bit higher than what we had projected. Our number of open enrollment students in has ended a little bit higher than what we projected. We've had typically have savings from staff retirement resignations. Uh, and so our historical process has been getting to the fall and then hoping to do better than what we had identified in our budget process as a, as a, as a planning piece. Uh, as board members know, obviously we're in a very unusual situation financially in that when we got to the fall, our student count declined, our open enrollment out increased, and overall, our finances took a step backward compared to what we had projected. So from the perspective of what you see on the screen, that dollar amount that was identified back in April is no longer, comp there is a 100% number of what you see from what we were estimating. The number has pulled back as our resources that we have available have pulled back from student count and other reasons. However, this is an incredibly complicated budget year because we're in November and there is a very large number of positions that have not been filled. These are FTE positions that were in the budget. Funds have been set aside for these positions and we've not been paying anything for them. So the question that Brian has been working through for a little while now is, what positions are we intending to try to fill and what positions at this point appear to be going into vacant status uh, for the remainder of the school year? So putting together the puzzle as far as the amount of resources we can dedicate towards salary and benefits is gonna take us a little bit more time to loop back to figure out what exactly can we free up to make sure we really are presenting the best proposal that we can. Our goal is still to present the best pay increase package that we can. It's going to take us looking at this from a little bit of a different lens than we have in recent past to try to put together a path to get there. There are a few other, I'm going to call them creative pieces that need to be discussed with the board. I would like to give you some ideas of what those creative aspects are, but I'd like to let Brian first talk about that topic of, of positions, how many have been sitting out there not being filled uh, where he sees us going with this and kind of the timeline of trying to make final decisions on what it is that we're intending to fill and what it is that we're intending to just leave open. So Brian, is it okay if I kick it over to you first and let you talk through that and then I'll jump back in when you're done? Yes, thanks Steve. Uh, an additional attachment uh, under that part of the agenda was the open para, open para educator positions. And so this particular uh, spreadsheet that is on there lists 23 different positions. Um, and, and of those 23, the information that you've got there, it's, so it's um, the, the first column is just uh, status, which is open. The posted means that we had put it, it's, it's out there as a potential to position to accept applicants. Um, and while we were accepting applicants, we've not taken any action uh, on, on them. Some have applicants, some, some do not. Um, and then the description is the third column. The fourth column is the number of hours per day. And the fifth column uh, is um, the school that it's based out of. 
Um, you see two groups, there's 20 on the top, and then there's three, a gap, and then there's three. Uh, the gap, the three positions would be, as you can see, uh, one year leave, uh, LOA, leave of absence. Those are uh, employees uh, that based on their personal circumstances um, are on a leave of absence that's medically related. Uh, so those would be folks that would be planning on returning to those roles next year. Uh, the other positions are kind of what Steve had mentioned. Uh, positions that to date we have not paid wages for because they have not been filled for this school year. And so there, there's a known amount saved, which even if we started to fill these uh, at this point, we would have saved, you know, essentially two, at this point, two, in, two months as, or and change of wages that we didn't pay or benefits we didn't pay to someone because no one was in that role. Uh, on this list right now, I would say we're probably down to 90%. 90% of that list uh, ha has been, uh, it's been established that we are not going to fill them this year. We were able to function without them. Uh, we've made arrangements to work around it. That last 10% uh, I'm in discussion with uh, several different buildings about um, how we, how and when moving forward we need to, to, to look at these roles. And so, um, we're, as, you know, as Steve uh, had brought up the, you know, uh, the budget and the budget committee review and the board review of these items, uh, prior to the, to, the bo to the budget committee meeting on November 16th, uh, I will have finalized with the principals which role, which roles we will be hiring or not hiring, and have a number from this sheet uh, that we will be able to add back into the budget um, for for compensation purposes. Um, that is a it's a very typical process that that uh, other districts use. Uh, that you, you look at openings first as an opportunity to boost uh, compensation uh, when you have budgets that are in difficult situations. We, we have a challenging situation, as Steve had brought up, about some of the things that are unique uh, to this fall uh, in terms of revenue loss for us. This is one way for us to gain some of that, that revenue loss back. And, and I, I don't, I'm not prepared at this time to say which ones are fully uh, on the table or which ones are off, but we're at about 90% on that right now. Brian, can you just give an example of how the duties have been absorbed? Sure. Uh, I, I think part, part of it is that uh, right now when we're functioning in a hybrid, uh, we have less students um, in a classroom at, a, at, a, at any given time. We're, you know, approximately 50% capacity in a classroom. And so when, when there are less students um, in the class, there is a need for less adult supports. Okay. So in, instead of, like for uh, some of the special education support positions, if we were to have a full, full house, if you would, um, we would have multiple students with presenting needs that are gonna have, uh, need adult support with them uh, or adult check-ins throughout the day. Um, because only half of them are there at a time, or some are actually learning virtually, um, we need less we need less supports at any moment. And so it, it would be similar in the regular education environment. It, it, it does mean that um, you know some of those duties are absorbed by other pair educators. Some of those duties are absorbed by uh, would be absorbed by teachers, uh, and then some of those duties. Uh, are just not done because we're not doing certain okay. things like like lunch. recess or recess. lunch. Right. Are, are we basing this budget on the idea that we will not be going back 100% at all in this, this budget? If we're talking about these positions and not filling these positions, yes, that that would be uh, that would be part of there there would that would be part of the consideration. Absolutely, if we had oper if we were operating at full capacity. It, we would have less flexibility to to eliminate positions. Um, yes, it, absolutely. Is there any concern that we set this budget this early in the year 
with the unknown of spring? I, I think we have to acknowledge, Joan, that that, uh, that certainly that certainly has to has to be a consideration. Um, Do we have a backup plan if we need these people in the spring? <laughs> well, uh, Do we have the money closet? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have not found them. I've not found that closet yet. Uh, uh -huh. But I will keep. I'll keep looking for it. Um, I, I would say that to a certain extent. We also have, uh, you know, the loss, the, the decreased number of students yeah. does mean that some of these positions, even if we were at full operating at full capacity, some of these positions we would not need because we do have less students in the district in total than we had last year. So we're just still guessing our way through this whole thing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have to face the fact if we all come back at 100%, we're going to have to buy some money somewhere. That, that's that's, that's an that's an act. We will have a we will have a challenge at that time. Okay. That's different than the challenge we have at this time. But in in response to that, it looks like many of these have been posted for a long time, and we haven't had anybody interested in filling them. I would not say that they, uh, we have, yeah, we've absolutely had these posted. Uh, some of them are posted within group postings. Uh, so they're just a general, you know, it would cover that. Um, but y yes, we, there, there was a combination, of, certainly a combination of factors. Some of it was uh, strategic in, in that, um, you know, once we started to look at some of the uh, revenue losses that we had, at that point, I, we did put a hiring freeze on, and, and part of it was operational, that when we were looking at operating at less than capacity in a different way, uh, we could function without them. And, and part of it was also that when we were at still a point where we would have hired, there, there wasn't people to hire. Um, and so it, it's really, I'd say all three have, have, have combined to this point, at this point, we're saying we're not filling purposefully, but that was not always the case. If I could just jump back in for a minute. So I think the, the key is for us to make sure that we've identified that total dollar amount that is at this point no longer going to be invested in FTE that absolutely can be allocated towards pay increases with the understanding that as we move into the 2020-2021 budget process, any of these positions that would need to come back, assuming a return to normal operations, have to go into the budget process as a first draw on funds available. Because obviously pay increases are permanent. So let's just take a dollar amount. Let's just say we're going to try to move $250,000 out of FTE over into pay increases. If those positions are required next fall in a return to normal situation, that 250,000 has to be the first thing that we insert into the budget planning process is a return to normal for our FTE. Now, Brian brought up student enrollment. Our student enrollment declined. So by nature, the FTE investment that we make is typically reduced. So there may be a point where some of these positions would permanently not come back. The point I just wanna make sure everybody's on the same page with this one, and I'll make the same point to the budget committee, is that the shift from FTE to pay increases is absolutely appropriate to do, and it makes sense given we have the resources. But as we move forward, 
we will have to recapture the funds necessary to put these positions back in. I don't want anybody to be surprised by that. So I wanna make sure all of the board members fully understand that, that they're okay with that and that they're expecting to see that if come spring, when we start presenting the following year's budget process, Brian has worked through, you know, hey, we didn't fill 10 positions, but I'm believing five need to come back, that there's gonna be a draw right away that shows five positions. And I just wanna make sure that that makes sense to everybody and that that concept is something you would be okay with because obviously this is not a situation that we've been in before. aspects of that I would say um, we have as a district and as a school board we, we prioritize keeping all employment groups uh, consistent when we in terms of when we uh, offer a, uh, compensation increases we offer them all at the same time um, part of it is uh, for budget purposes so that we can see the whole picture uh, and that we can look at that, look at them at the same point. And part of them is philosophical about the importance of all employee groups to our operations. Um, and so that that be you know with that being acknowledged is is part of our history. Um, as we look moving forward, uh, we in the past when we have done compensation increases have looked to provide them uh, in the month of December moving back to the start of our school year. Um, so, you know, folks right now are working off of last year's wage. Uh, in the past, when we put a compensation increase package together, we would then go back to what their uh, last year's wage was on July 1st and update it so that they would call, get what we call back pay. They would get back paid that wage increase amount in the month of December. Uh, based on the timing, that, that we that we need to we had to follow as a district, uh, which was related to uh, some of the unique COVID expenses that we have uh, have had to to cover. Uh, we needed to see how the referendum turned out to see if we would be able to use the referendum to cover COVID related expenses, um, because that would allow for us to even consider compensation increases. Without, because without the referendum for COVID, those COVID expenses had, would have to come out of our regular budget and they would have really put us in a spot where we didn't have an opportunity to even consider compensation. Um, because that has happened, and now we are aware of that, as we look at terms of timelines, which would involve negotiations uh, with the teaching association, um, when they uh, are recertified, if they recertify through their election, which is currently uh, occurring, we're really looking at uh, our first opportunity to, to have this full picture of information of all of our employee groups in the month of December, which means that um, because of the, the process of, of actually calculating the wages, benefits, and retirement um, that, that occurs within my office, um, we are, we are not going to, to be able to, to provide any compensation back pay during the month of December. Um, we, we would be looking at a delayed delivery of that into, uh, into January. And so um, I think it's important that uh, we, you know, we kind of establish that and, and make sure we get that word out. And so part of, part of our plan is I want to hear from, from you folks uh, that we still want to continue to, to keep all groups under consideration at the same time um, and that um, that you know an understanding that we because of the delays we are going to be looking at a January delivery date 
and, and moving forward, we would certainly communicate that to employees so that they know to expect that. Um, but I guess just want to make sure that that is something that you uh, agree with, support, um, or, and, un and understand. And so that, I guess I'd flip it to, to you as a committee. Yeah, it's, you know, it's an unusual year and I know we like to get those increases out as soon as we can, but we did have to have information about the referendum and the fact that our teachers are certifying uh, a couple months late. I think it's important that we keep all our employee groups on the same timeline. I think it's easier for your office. It seems to be what we've done in the past and it's unfortunate we have to make them wait, but I, I support that. I agree with you. It's an unusual year, so, but we want to stay as consistent as from year to year as we can, except for, you know, we have to look at that day in January. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I agree too. I think the other push is to help to get the word out as to why this is happening so that it's up front that they understand what's going on and it's coming. Everybody's experienced a lot of pressure and extra duties and, and lots of things. Yeah, and I think it, we also need to recognize that the reason we wait for um, pay increases at this time of the year is to give the absolute maximum we can find. If we did this in July, we'd only guess, and it would probably be low. You know, I. I appreciate that we wait until we have all the information yeah. so we can give as much as we can. But, you know, it's just unfortunate it's late. I, I'm just a little hesitant when we've got some teacher listening sessions coming up. If we have the information out there to meet the questions that will come at us for whoever is at the listening session. So that we don't step on our own feet and misspeak what, what's going to happen. And for your information, Ryan, we're scheduling them for the week of the 16th, primarily. Okay. The 16th. So that will be after the budget meeting, and maybe we can have a little, you know, fact sheet to share because that will mm -hmm. be an important thing that they will ask about. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks uh, for bringing that up. It's important that we that we kind of stay on the same page and yeah. deliver accurate information. Um, I'll I'll work with uh, Steve, Steve and Annie uh, to create some uh, communication uh, that we'll both go out, we'll push out on a larger scale to all, and then share with with uh, the board for for you guys to have that when you do your session. Yeah, I think you can be there with a blank sheet. Um, one other aspect of compensation increases I, I wanted to revisit with the committee was um, last year uh, the HR committee at, tasked me with uh, looking at a, a wage schedule for our hourly employees. Um, and that was something that, uh, you know, his, to, to, it builds off of what we currently have, which is we currently have a five-year wage schedule uh, for, for hourly employees so that they can see where you will be at year one, year two, year three, etc. On, on your anniversary date. Um, after year five, we have a maximum rate identified for the hourly employees, but we don't have uh, a schedule of how they would get to that rate. And so what the HR committee last year supported, the board supported, was the idea of creating a schedule for, for hourly employees so that they could see how do you go from a, a new employee to the, the hourly maximum for your pay scale. And so uh, we did, uh, I did create that uh, last year in, in working with a, a compensation consultant, uh, Carlson Detman, to, to build that schedule out. Um, it, it does involve and it does have, uh, it does have a cost to it because what it will do is it will take our employees from years six beyond and place them 
in the appropriate, place them appropriately. It, it, will, it will place, the, again, and it's a 15 year schedule. So that it will lay out year, uh, year one to year 15 being the maximum rate of pay at that rate at that, for that role. It will lay out employees and tell them how they can progress. Um, it will then, but to do so, uh, we have right now, uh, I guess what the other topic that, we, that was related to this is that the schedule, uh, while it was very, the five year schedule that we currently have is certainly very good to our early employees. The challenge is that it created wage compression because those folks moved more quickly through the five years. Anyone beyond year six and beyond uh, only got general package increases. Um, and so they moved, uh, your, your, our more experienced employees moved more slowly through the scale while our new employees move more quickly. And so that created, you know, as I said, wage compression where some of our most experienced people were not making a lot more than folks that had only been here a few years or a shorter time. And so the schedule itself takes those experienced people uh, based on their years within our organization and places them. And so even if there is no uh, wage increase, if the package doesn't change, there would be a cost to do that because right now we have experienced hourly employees that are working uh, for a rate that's very close or somewhat close to the five year rate uh, and they should be much further out. And so uh, that, that I, I guess I, I just well, I wanted to circle back to the group. The, the cost of that right now, the, just the straight placement uh, of, of our experienced employees, the cost for that is $80,000. I, I guess I, I'm here to advocate or, or advocate for the, the um, use of that scale and development of that scale this year, but also ask uh, you, the committee if that is still uh, a philosophy and goal to, to, to use that and build that system, um, put, enact that system for our experienced hourly employees. Well, I know that that's something we have been working on for many years, and it really goes back to Act 10 when some of our pay groups used to have a kind of a longevity scale, and then we got rid of that for some reason. And so, you know, a really great 15 year employee only got our 2% or 2.5%, that's all they ever got. They never got more. So I have been on this committee and I respect and I advocate that we need to look out for those employees. We've lost really solid, valuable people because their pay kept skipping or slipping in, you know, in comparison to other people in that position in other districts. I guess I think we need to see kind of a, a how does it fit with our budget this year? Sure. You know, our budget this year is so different and so constrained that we don't know what not hiring that group of employees that we just talked about will do. We don't know how many staff positions we can divert to um, our referendum, our COVID expenses, because we have staff members that were hired only because of the COVID year. Personally, I would love to support that, Brian. I guess I think we just need to see it in the mix of everything else. I would love to see our teaching staff get more than 600 points. Personally, I think they have, this has been probably the most difficult year for them to do their job. And I advocate that we look carefully at bumping that up to at least the 900 range. Um, I think we need to see a spreadsheet of, if we do this, then it means this, if we do this, then it means this. I, I don't know where we are budget wise. I agree with Joan too on that too. I want to, this is a, such a unique year, but I also agree with the philosophy of that scale. Yes. Because you, during the first five years, you're putting time and effort into training an individual, and if they last,
all of that, I, I wonder if if there isn't some money somewhere when you talk about COVID expenses, I think what the teachers have had to do to do yeah. virtual, to pull together everything that they've had to do has been an extraordinary amount of work for everybody. It isn't like they had it planned like they've done every other year. They've worked above and beyond if you're looking at overtime I wonder if there's any way we can get some COVID funds into that pot. Um, what I would say is, is absolutely, uh, as we have always, as we have traditionally done, we part of the the benefit of looking at all employee groups together is we can we can really see how the interplay between different groups mm -hmm. affects the total budget number, and, and absolutely the 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 wage schedule. Can, can be something that we fold into that, and I show you how that affects and, and what that does, um, what that does for for um, for the total budget picture. And, and in terms, just just the one note, uh, I, mean, I don't, I'm not, I acknowledge what you were saying, Judy. Uh, the only point I would minor tweak is is um, educators, uh, teachers, uh, certified educators. While they put in additional time, I hesitate to use the word overtime because educators are, are not uh, able to, to act. there is no overtime for, for educators. It, it's within the, um, the FLSA, the, you know, the Labor Standards Act. And so, but well, I do understand overtime, the essence. So it's, it, yeah. Not overtime, but you're looking at extended, sure. extended duties in the sense that you've been reading about how you have to clean your own room and all the things of prep that went into it, you also have to take care of the safety of your room and added responsibility. And so I don't know what you call it, but it seems like we need to acknowledge the the extra duties that are mm -hmm. put on everybody, really. But yeah, you know, everybody. But you everybody. know, the administrators, the everybody. Yeah, this has been yeah, mm -hmm. this has been one tough year. Yeah, and so maybe it can't be maybe it can't be monetary, but it certainly needs to be appreciated. Like you say. We're coming every Monday, but everybody's working. Yeah, yeah. you guys have to prepare for us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, and we will uh, to follow our tradition where we're we're putting those forecasts together for for all of you to review. Uh, you know, you, our our committee, the HR committee, obviously worked closely with the budget committee, at, which then advises the whole board, and so we will continue to put that information together and, and show you different ways that we can. Uh, accomplish what you're asking us to try to accomplish. Hey, Brian. Yes. Yes, sir. I couldn't really hear the board dialogue. Could you just quickly sum it up for me, what we're looking for? Uh, they, they would like us to put together a picture, Steve, of how the wage scale, uh, the hourly wage scale, can play into the budgetary funds that we have available and the package that we put together. Uh, they also shared that they would they would like us to look at uh, how can we use some of the COVID related uh, funds for uh, acknowledging the additional COVID related work that that our regular recurring staff uh, across the board are, are putting in to this very unique and challenging year. Okay. Got it. So, Steve, when you put the budget together, will you peel out every position and all the extra time that was would not have been there if it had been a normal year? Does that get peeled out and be compensated through the referendum? Like our additional second grade staff, our additional third grade staff? Yes. Yeah, so, what we're currently working on is setting up all of the account numbers that we need to go with the additional resources that were approved by the public and going really back all the way to July 1st and making sure that everything and anything that's related to COVID is pulled out of regular operational funds and moved over to the referendum funds. Okay. Uh, it's easier to do that on the non-salary benefit side, but we have 
examples on the salary and benefit side. We've set up committees in the school buildings. Uh, those were paid. Oh, yeah. As an example, we had social worker, I'm sorry, we had psychologists in doing additional work. So yes, that is our intent, is to go through and capture all of that to move it from regular operational expenses to COVID related and connected to the referendum. Thank you. Steve, are we gonna, are you able to forecast due to the referendum the to a certain extent what it looks like five years from now once that referendum ceases to exist yeah that's a great question so as you know back in august it initially we put forward a concept of a recurring referendum. The board then asked us to go take a look at the concept of a non-recurring referendum. Uh, either one would have been effective. We move forward with a non-recurring piece. The most important thing we can do with the referendum that just passed is to make sure that we are always assigning one time costs to the referendum funds. So therefore, at a point when the referendum funds are no longer remaining, we do not have any ongoing expenditures tied to it. And so that's what we're doing right now with looking at anything COVID related, anything we would not have normally done, looking at the use of the referendum funds as we move into 21-22, examples of that are likely going to be if we continue to have a demand from parents asking for full-time virtual options, we're going to need to take a look at these referendum funds as options for paying for that, uh, and especially analyzing whether or not this is gonna be a new long-term approach or is this just still parents needing some time to gain confidence in returning to a traditional school setting when we're past the period of generally accepted vaccination and, and being available to the entire public? So yeah, this is gonna be something we're gonna have to have ongoing conversations on, but making sure that we're always connecting the right type of expenses to the referendum money. So when we get into the future, we're not gonna have that funding cliff happen. So does it make sense that we would not be using COVID funds for any type of salary increase? That would yes, be that's, yes. Right. Yep, our goal on salary increases is gonna be to find the long-term resources that go with it and to connect it. Uh, but to look at again, freeing up to Joan's point, funds that we've spent on COVID related expenditures out of our regular operational budget, freeing those up instead for pay increases. And then on the referendum fund side, looking at all appropriate opportunities to move those COVID related and one-time expenditures into that referendum fund that puts us in a better position, both with dealing with COVID related expenses and being able to free up funds for pay increases. Thank you. Okay, um, where are we, Brian? Uh, Do you have teacher compensation committee updates? Yeah, so last year, uh, a significant chunk of the year, uh, a committee of of uh, teachers and administration uh, were looking at the teacher uh, salary system. Uh, we got to a point where we had built uh, some, uh, some conceptual, or built a, a conceptual idea of, of what it could be moving forward that coincided about uh, when COVID changed uh, everything for all. And so we paused our work at that point. Um, we're reconvening uh, with that group next week uh, to see what our next steps are. Um, and on the, on the topic will be 
you know, kind of we were at the point where we were going to start to seek out a larger, more global amount of feedback from, from the teaching group as a whole um, to communicate with that, that committee um, how we could do that in these times, but also discuss is this still the appropriate time for us to, to be reviewing this. Uh, it is certainly a very important topic, uh, but one that does have a lot of emotion and, and angst to it uh, when we start to talk about a compensation system. And, and so to talk with that committee to get their sense of is, is it work that we should continue moving forward at this time? Is this work that we should pause and revisit when things have stabilized? And, and so uh, that discussion and that next, those next steps will be marked out kind of starting next week and we'll uh, I will share how where we're at as we're moving forward with that with, with this committee as well. How long is that committee? Uh, I would say we're approximately a dozen, uh, I think is and so it's it's a it's about a fifty fifty uh, teacher to to uh, admin. Or actually I think there might be more uh, teachers than there are admin, but it's very close. Um, the true time conversion update. Uh, true time is the electronic time uh, card system that we started to uh, work with last year. Started to we started to, to build that um, about in January, uh, and so that would replace uh, the paper time cards that we current paper time cards and, and annualized hourly pay that we currently use. Um, Again, uh, it's a, I feel like kind of a broken record. Uh, we had a plan of implementation uh, for the spring uh, where we would start with some pilot groups and, and then uh, larger pilot groups and then look at putting that into place over the summer. Uh, COVID uh, again came and, and changed that implementation plan for us. Uh, so what we have done in lieu of the larger implementation plan is we've started to, as we we sought out volunteers from different hourly employee groups, uh, and we've also moved in all of our new hires uh, since May of this year into the True Time system. So the net result is right now we have about 10% of our hourly employees within this. Um, we found it it is working great in, in terms of uh, the accuracy and timeliness that it provides uh, are, are very important and, and probably at to, to my, uh, you know, what I, I think has been one of the most important updates is it, it's, when I say accuracy, uh, I mean accuracy of, of calculations, right? It, when you can have a computer calculate, you know, total hours and, and compensate, it takes out the potential for any, you know, for human error, either on the entry side from the employee, uh, on the supervisor side, or in the, in the payroll side. And so that accuracy is, is obviously been a huge benefit, but the other part, which is equally important, is it's our responsibility as an employer to pay hourly people for the time that they work. Instead of, you know, they have an eight hour schedule, but uh, they work nine hours, we'll pay them for the eight, and you know, that, that, that's not it's, not, it's not right, but it's also not legal. And, and so the true time system has allowed, has, has allowed us to see uh, in some cases, positions that have traditionally worked much more than their, their regular hourly schedule. Uh, we're now paying them accurately, but we've also gotten into the point where we can start to talk and have good conversations about how, what should this position look like moving forward? Uh, which duties belong here? Uh, does it need more, et cetera? And, and that's been, a, I think, a really important legal part of the accuracy moving forward. Um, the, as we look into the future, uh, our goal is to transition all of our hourly employees to this system. Um, but we want to do it uh, at, at the start of a school year um, because there's one really important aspect to this is that uh, when we, an we currently annualize pay, which means that if you're an hourly worker, 
and you're expected to work eight hours a day, uh, you know, 188 years, uh, 188 days out of the year. We take the number of hours that that is, the wage rate that you're at, divide it all over the number of payrolls, and we start paying you the first payroll uh, that occurs after you're active in the school year. What that also means is that we're in essence paying people for hours that they've not yet worked. So we're pre we're prepaying employees. And, and so the, the part that is sticky about this conversion is that it will involve a, a you know, you will work, all employees will work for two weeks, submit their hours, work for two more weeks, and then they will be paid at the end of that pay period for the first two weeks of pay. Wow. So there will be a two-week gap in, in pay for, for folks, which is, which is well in the bounds of legal, and right. it's, it's more accurate, but it is a very significant financial aspect. And so what we want, to, and that's the reason why I want to kind of make sure that we, are, we remain committed to it as a as a as a HR committee, as a board, as a district, because part of the plan is that we're going to give employees six at minimum six month advance notice that this will start on July first of twenty twenty one. Yeah. Plan accordingly, uh, and, and I would also see that we could loop that communication in uh, to to back pay time to let them know that this could you know this this back pay money could be budgeted or forecasted for, for that purpose. Um, but just to make sure people have, we want people to know and see this coming from way, uh, way out in, onto the horizon so that it doesn't capture or put anybody into a bad position. So it may delay payment, the first payment for two weeks, but it extends it on the other end. Yeah, absolutely. After that, I mean, the folks once will, you get going. Yeah, fo once you're in, the, the only time that there is a two-week gap is upon institution. After that, you're on a regular two-week schedule as if you always had been. But it is that initial implementation, there is a, a gap. Yeah. So how are the employees that will be on that system receiving that information now? I mean, I so, assume they know it's coming. Uh, so the, the folks that are already doing it? Or the folks that are not, the, not yet converted over to it? Oh, well, kind of both. I so mean, the, 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 the folks that we knew hire, we communicate that too. And, and to, to be honest, that, that's the way it works. They don't know that, that's, the, that's the way it works almost everywhere for, for, you for hourly them up employees. You, get paid. you, you right. put in the hours before you get paid. And, mm -hmm. and so we are, um, as we, when we were investigating this, we are, we are very late to the, to the electronic timekeeping game. This, this is not a new, <laughs> that we're not even, we're not even uh, near the cutting edge, like the cutting edge is, <laughs> yeah, and, and we're we're very uh, I would say very historic in terms of using annualized pay. That, that's very uncommon in any anywhere, even in schools these days. Um, in fact, we found, which has been great, because we've certainly had many really positive conversations with surrounding school districts who've done this and have been doing it for a long time. It's really helped guide our implementation. But it, it you know it is uh, it, it is not. It's it's not um, it is not without its pain point, but that's really the only one. Um, and so the second part is what about employees that are currently with us and are not transitioned to it? Um, we have certainly uh, communicated this to to the employees that are already doing it. Uh, we have not, on a large scale, communicated this out um, to to other hourly employees. That would be the advance, big, large advance notice that we would want to provide to folks at least six months in advance. So you need approval from the full board to move forward on it, or just information? Uh, uh, information and just making sure that folks still support the idea. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I support it. Mm -hmm. It yeah. benefits the district as a whole, even though you said there's a pain, pain point right, right away. So. And it should benefit the employees. Right. They should really be paid. Okay, uh, substitute pool update. Um, shared a little bit at the last board meeting. Uh, for 
uh, folks that have uh, volunteered to or expressed an interest in becoming substitutes, but they're not certified, um, we've already provided the information to them about how to uh, take the online certification course uh, and how to, to um, then turn around and get, uh, connect that to getting a DPI license. Um, and then ultimately from there apply to be in our substitute pool. Uh, I've not checked. I've not checked our uh, ap application pool the last three days of this week, or since the beginning of the week. Um, so we have not yet seen an influx of applicants. Uh, hoping that those folks are going to start to come, uh, start to finalize the process soon. Um, we've also put the information out onto the website so that it's not only our uh, application process, but if you've never been a substitute before, how do you go through? How do you become one? And, uh, and so that we're doing that to continue to boost our, our pool. Um, and then we have the posting out at this point for building subs. Uh, I'm right now working with uh, our attorney to create um, the unique contract that they will be under, which is different than, it's a different contract than what a long-term sub would have, and it's a different contract than what a full-time recurring employee would have. It's kind of almost a hybrid, uh, and so he's helping me create that language so that we are got something set up for, for those folks, and we will begin the hiring process uh, probably as soon as next week. Do you have a sense of what's in the pipeline for numbers? Um, it, it, there's been interest, I would say. There, there's been interest um, in, in that. I think what I've seen is, is some of our best and when I say our best substitutes, the folks that we, we can count on to take a lot of our work, have expressed an interest in those roles as well. Um, and I, I think that that is, you know, that, that's a really good thing. Um, and so it, it also will help us have that stability. Um, I was just thinking of the general sub pool too. Our, our sub, uh, it, it's not, our, our sub pool has not been increasing, uh, which is not terribly uncommon. Once you get into the school year, typically you're going to see your sub pool uh, <coughs> applicants boost at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then you're going to kind of see that mid year when when college students uh, graduate, you know, mid year, and they're looking for positions. Mm -hmm. you, you'll see a boost at those two times, um, and then they pretty slow otherwise. Um, we we didn't. Uh, you know, we, we didn't get a, you know, it was a little smaller than normal in the fall. I just wondered if we had any response from the number of parents who said they'd be interested in helping them. Not, not, not yet. Okay. Um, not, not yet. Uh, hopeful that that will mm -hmm. start soon. Okay. Brian, the teachers who took the FFTA mm -hmm. leave, was that for 10 or 12 weeks? It's up to 12 weeks. Uh, so we're starting to see those folks uh, coming back uh, this month and in December, early December. And then, <coughs> can anybody apply for that now? I know it expires. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, it, 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 uh, it's, um, right now it does expire on December 31st. It, it will take an act of, con act of Congress to extend it. Um, anyone can apply up to that date to use it. In fact, uh, just, Last week, had a, an employee whose family circumstances changed applied to, to start at that point. But then they they have to be <coughs> back at the end of the year, or do they get to run the whole? They they it, it's uh, when uh, if anyone would be starting at this point, they would not have uh, yeah, sixty days time. worth of time. Okay. It it and when it when the December thirty first ends, um, they. They've been, it's been communicated to them that they will need to return to school, which would be a, a, our first day is a, after winter break is January 4th. And so it's been communicated to them that they need to plan on returning. All right, thank you. Um, I guess our last item is request for unpaid leave of absence. Um, and, and kind of that last discussion actually folds into this one a little bit. Uh, we've had, I would say, a combination of, of two, two different uh, situations have started to approach me to ask what their options are. Uh, we've had a, a small number of folks 
that are, are on FFCRA leave have asked, um, my fa you know, I've said, my family cir circumstances haven't changed. You know, my, my children, uh, their school district is still virtual, or, you know, and they're not able to go back. Uh, what, what are my options uh, going forward? And, and we've also, I've also heard from some employees uh, at the 512 level who have said, you know, I could see this coming. Um, what are my options uh, if I'm not comfortable continuing to work in, in, during this time? Or, and or others saying, I, I, you know, I need to take care of my family, my children. Uh, and the reason I ask about unpaid leaves of absence is that um, there is a provision in the teacher handbook uh, for unpaid leave um, that is, uh, that can be given to teaching staff um, at the discretion of um, myself, the human resources role, uh, director of human resources. In the past, it was Randy. We transitioned it over the summer. Um, it has never been used for long-term unpaid leave. It's, it's always been a, a short-term circumstances, uh, you know, maybe days, maybe a week. Um, but the language would permit, the language would allow us to offer it to employees for a remainder of a school year. Um, and my question for the HR committee is, do you want me to begin to interpret the language in that manner to offer unpaid leave to employees so that they would, again, they basically, but for benefits purposes, um, they could continue via COBRA uh, at their own expense, but their wages would cease. Um, and then they, but they would be guaranteed an opportunity to come back to their role the next year. Um, and then we obviously would go out and hire a long-term replacement for them um, to finish off the year. Do, do you want me to begin to offer that to employees? Do you support, uh, and let me, let me tee it up a little bit. I, I think that it, I think that it's, it, it's a good, I personally think it's a good up. It's a good thing for us to do that. It prevents putting people in the position where they are going to leave our district because of their circumstances that they either can or cannot control. Um, we would still get a chance to get them back, um, and in the meantime, we we probably are going to have our best chance of hiring if we can answer, offer someone full-time work and, and benefits. It's not ideal, and don't, don't baby, we're not, no. not ideal to, to be out hiring, but it's, it's our best chance. Uh, I think the long-term effect is we, we keep that teacher in our district, and I think that's, that's important. We've got that experience, mm -hmm. take a long time to find another one that would be ready to you know, it seems that some of the positions that are being asked, we already have a long-term club in there. Mm -hmm. And the continuity for those children, if we could offer the teacher that they have had now for 12 weeks the continuity of keeping them. And I agree with Judy, you know, at the end of it, what do we want as a district? We want the best people that we can hire and if they that we, I, I, I support doing that. So, no penalty for choosing to do it? So this, this would not, it would be a situation where we would allow them to, they, they would, they'd be requesting an unpaid leave of absence, we'd be granting it. It would be different than someone who's asking to be released from their contract and resign. That we do have a liquidated, uh, liquidated damages provision in there. Th these folks would not. There would be uh, no cost to them. And it's currently in the handbook. It, it, is, it does exist in the handbook. It's just never been interpreted to be this length of time. It's always been short increments. I mean, there's, the language doesn't, the site doesn't say that. It's just that's been practice. It doesn't give a length of time. No. Do, you, do we have the option to deny it? Because it's not in the handbook. 
Yes, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, at at the uh, at the administration's discretion. So That's what it's good in the past. Yep. So it's continued to do that. Yep. And you're just asking us to encourage you to say go ahead and grant it. I guess I I I, I, I want to make sure that the HR committee um, isn't uncomfortable with that because it, it's a different interpretation of the handbook. I think it's a significant different interpretation. Um, I, I just it doesn't require a language change, but I, I just want to make sure you're comfortable with it. I think, Brian, I trust that you have each individual's interest and their safety and what's best for them in mind, and you showed that. And I trust that you will make wise decisions in granting people the time they need to deal with the situation that they want. Yeah, I mean, I, I have nothing against that. I just want to make sure it was in the handbook. Mm -hmm. And that we, I, I definitely don't want to take anything away <laughs> that's already in writing. And, like, you know, um, but it may be something that, that when we do after the school year or whatever policy comes back up, mm -hmm. you know, clarify, maybe. Sure. But I agree. There's a discretion. I, you know, I think it sort of feels like We've micromanaged a little bit, but I think it's just because we've met so much as a full board. Yeah. You know, I trust our administration that's been doing the right things. I, tr I know the compassion that we you guys have in both students and staff. So I, again, I, I have nothing against it. I believe in your interpretation of it, and, and feel free to use it as needed. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, are we down to the bottom? Um, so. Are you ready to adjourn now? I am. I think Steve, I are you ready to adjourn? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> motion to adjourn. I, I say we should adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate all that you guys are doing and looking out for. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for a long meeting. <laughs> sticking with us. Sticking with us. Are you ready to be off, Steve? Or did you need to talk to somebody? Oh, I'm good, thank you. All right.